Welcome to First Steps on Accessing Global Markets presentation. The economic and legislative environment has never been so favourable for Australian businesses to explore exporting. Today we have a team of experts on the topic of accessing export markets, so you can get up close and personal with the professionals who can help you to get started or get serious about exporting. As you will hear from the presentation team, there are some compelling reasons to consider and implement an export market strategy. However, this decision should not be taken lightly. Our objective from today is to arm you with an overview of the elements to be considered and addressed before you commence exporting. There is quite a bit of information to follow over the course of the next hour or so, but there are three overriding messages. Develop a plan, do your research, and seek advice from experienced professionals. Please contact the presenters directly should you require additional information. Our team of expert presenters will share valuable insights on how to successfully embark on accessing global markets. Our presenters today are Angie Winton from Hanrick Curran. I'll outline how you can prepare your current business operations to be ready to access export markets. Diana Georgieva from Australian Business Consulting Solutions will outline the key steps to export successfully and the support available to you. Then Leah Fua from Hopgood Ganim will summarise the free trade agreements and the foundation legal frameworks to be considered. And finally, we'll finish with a short corporate video profiling how Export Finance Insurance Corporation can help you access the funding you need. My name is Angie Winton, a business improvement consultant at Henrik Curran, Chartered Accountants. At Henrik Curran, we specialise in assisting business owners to grow and manage risk in their business to generate wealth for the future. Henrik Curran has an international footprint through an active membership in Elliott Group, a worldwide alliance of independent professional firms to support clients with sustainable and successful international expansion. Getting the correct advice up front is crucial to ensuring your international business as a success. When it comes to big business decisions, the old saying holds true. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. This is especially relevant to the opportunity of accessing global markets through exporting and will be the overriding message you'll take from the presentations. Let's explore what's involved in planning to export. Diana, who is speaking next, will comprehensively outline a seven-step plan to successfully approach export markets. You will hear how an export plan should sit neatly within a broader business plan. Before you advance into that, let's consider a few pre-planning activities and the planning you'll need to do relating to your finances. First things first, you need to get your house in order domestically. This really is a prerequisite to commencing export planning. Once you've progressed through the first few steps of your export plan, you'll need to do some robust financial assessments. We'll discuss what's involved in assessing the financial viability of an export opportunity. Then we need to familiarise yourself with the EMDG so you can prepare to maximise access to the Export Market Development Grant. And finally, we need to look at getting the right business structure so that you can take your goods and services into another country. Let's consider these planning and pre-planning elements in a little bit more detail. Before you commence exporting and entering into agreements with buyers or distributors, you should assess the suitability of your current business structure for exporting activity. You need to have due regard to your corporate structure when expanding your business, including the introduction of export capability. As with all corporate structures, the primary objective is to achieve asset protection, which is why it's commonplace to hold assets such as IP, licences, registrations and other intangibles in a separate entity from the trading activities. If your corporate structure isn't offering suitable protection to your business assets, then commencing an export strategy should trigger a business structure review. Entering new export markets brings a degree of uncertainty, so it's important to ensure you protect what you have at the same time as forging forward with business growth. The cost of expanding your corporate structure will need to be weighed up against the risks of not doing it, and it will depend on the pace and size of your expansion plans. By way of example, if export revenue was a small portion of total revenue, and didn't require in-country presence, your existing domestic business structure may be appropriate. However, ex if expansion plans progress to an in-country premises and equipment, a more sophisticated structuring, such as the separation of international trading and asset entities shown in the diagram, may be appropriate. 
Your plans to not repatriate all foreign income back into Australia due to investments being made in your export destination will also be a factor to consider. There are different structures required depending on the country that you're exporting to. If, for example, you're exporting to the US, American buyers can be more comfortable trading with American companies given the strong level of patriotism. However, exporting to Asian countries, brand Australia is strong and you could sell directly into an Asian buyer from an Australian entity. Henrik Karen is part of the Elliott Group, a worldwide alliance of independent professional firms who we can call upon to provide in-country professional services to our clients when they're exporting to one of the 70 countries we have networks in. Once you've assessed your business capability and product or service suitability for an export market, you can commence preparing an export budget. This can be a daunting exercise when you're dealing with new markets, so starting with a list of all possible additional expense categories is helpful. Henrik Curran has developed an export budget template to assist with this very exercise. Ideally, you will build in some flexibilities for sensitivities in your sales results, such as a low case, likely case and high case, to help determine the real potential of your export expansion, but to also highlight where your sales break-even is. You would also ideally build in some flexibility for other key variables that could change over time. These might include the exchange rate, transport costs, intermediary costs and financing. It's best to develop your budget so it spans multiple years. This is so that you can see what your investment contribution from outside sources, such as the profits from your domestic business, need to be before the export venture is self-funding. It's no point starting the activity, investing in it for the first year, only to run out of capital before seeing it through to a profit-making result. You will need to have an accounting system that can handle multi-currency, now the major off-the-shelf accounting systems, including MyOp, the AccountRight and Premier versions, and Xero, all support multi-currency. You need to assess the need for foreign currency hedging at the outset, so that you can have the right banking partner working with you to meet this need. Having currency hedging in place will reduce the risk associated with outlaying Aussie dollars to fund the creation of your export offering, the sales proceeds then being received in another currency and need to be converted back to Aussie. So movements in exchange rates may be favourable to you, however, they may not be, resulting in profit margin erosion. Currency hedging can be secured at the time of sale, giving some certainty as to the Australian dollar equivalent value that you'll receive post-sale. At this juncture, you should also investigate the flexibility of retaining funds in the offshore jurisdiction and whether your bank can support that in the event that down the track you don't want to repatriate all the proceeds back to Australia. The key outcome from this exercise is to ensure that you know what KPIs you need to aim for to achieve a break-even, how long that will take, what capital you're likely to burn through, and ultimately, over time, some assurance that the exporting venture is likely to be a profitable one. Please download Henrik Curran's export budget template that you'll find on the international business page of our website. The Export Market Development Grant Scheme is a key Australian Government financial assistance program for aspiring and current exporters. It's administered by Austrade, supporting a wide range of industry sectors that are exporting products, intellectual property and know-how outside of Australia. The amount available to claim is up to 50% of eligible export promotion expenses. The method of determining your provisional grant is calculated as 50% of your eligible expenses, less a non-reimbursable threshold of $5,000. So by way of example, if you had eligible expenses of 45,000, your indicative claim would be 50% of 45,000 less five, so $20,000. You're required to have a minimum of total export expenses in a claim of $15,000 and need to have a minimum claim amount of 5,000. Eligible expenses are prescriptive and some examples include items such as cost to participate in international trade shows, airfares, cost to develop free samples of your product, producing promotional literature, and an allowance of $300 a day to meet accommodation and living expenses. To claim your first two grants, you don't need to actually be generating any export revenue. However, to make the third and subsequent claims, you will need to satisfy a performance measure, which you should discuss with your advisor. A business is able to claim 
eight grants in their lifetime and they don't need to be in consecutive years. If a business hasn't claimed before, they're able to combine two years of eligible expenses in the first claim. The claim is typically processed under a split payment system by Austrate. An initial payment up to an initial payment ceiling is allocated in round one. And a second tranche payment is made depending on the total value of EMDG applications received in that year will be allocated in round two. The payment ceiling amount is announced by Austrade in June of each year and is currently 150000 All claims need to be supported, so it's important to understand at the outset what expenses are eligible and what documentation you need to retain to support your claim. The value of any second round grant allocation shouldn't be relied on as it is highly dependent upon the EMDG budget and applications made. EMDG applications for the 2015-16 year will open on the 1st of July 2016. Before you commence exporting and entering into agreements with buyers or distributors, you should assess the suitability of your current business structure for exporting activity. You need to have due regard to your corporate structure when expanding your business, including the introduction of export capability. As with all corporate structures, the primary objective is to achieve asset protection which is why it's commonplace to hold assets such as IP, licences, registrations and other intangibles in a separate entity from the trading activities. If your corporate structure isn't offering suitable protection to your business assets, then commencing an export strategy should trigger a business structure review. Entering new export markets brings a degree of uncertainty, so it's important to ensure you protect what you have at the same time as forging forward with business growth. The cost of expanding your corporate structure will need to be weighed up against the risks of not doing it, and it will depend on the pace and size of your expansion plans. By way of example, if export revenue was a small portion of total revenue and didn't require in-country presence, your existing domestic business structure may be appropriate. However, ex if expansion plans progress to an in-country premises and equipment, a more sophisticated structuring, such as the separation of international trading and asset entities shown in the diagram, may be appropriate. Your plans to not repatriate all foreign income back into Australia due to investments being made in your export destination will also be a factor to consider. There are different structures required depending on the country that you're exporting to. If, for example, you're exporting to the US, American buyers can be more comfortable trading with American companies, given the strong level of patriotism. However, exporting to Asian countries, brand Australia is strong, and you could sell directly into an Asian buyer from an Australian entity. Henrik Curran is part of the Elliott Group, a worldwide alliance of independent professional firms, who we can call upon to provide in-country professional services to our clients when they're exporting to one of the 70 countries we have networks in. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Georgieva. I'm the manager of international trade for the Australian Business Consulting and Solutions, which is the trading arm of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland and the New South Wales Business Chamber. The agenda for today is steps to successful exporting and the support available to perform market research, strategy development, export marketing planning and implementation and finding potential business partners overseas. But before we go into delivering on today's agenda, I want to capture your attention on why would you consider exporting. To make additional profits will be definitely your major drive. And other reasons could be increased market size and opportunities, expanded customer network, enhanced competitiveness, growth and long-term expansion, improve return on investment, spreading operational costs over large input, or perhaps reducing seasonal fluctuations. We're just going to go through the seven steps of exporting. And the first step is your product and your company export capability assessment.
Is my product exportable? Some of the questions you need to find the answers for are what products and services you're selling now? Are these products or services capable of being marketed overseas? Is your product unique? And will that, you, this uniqueness be transferable to other markets? What is the ability to adapt your product or services if required? And why the existing customers are buying your product or service now? Is it because of the superior quality? Is it because of the low price? Or perhaps the after sell service or something else? And is this competitive advantage transferable in overseas market of interests? This is a big one. The next question is, is my company capable to export? To be able to determine whether your company is capable to export, you have to review resources in terms of organizational structure, personnel, funds available, technology, production facilities, and the level of commitment to export of top management. Can your current organizational structure accommodate export operations? And um, are you prepared to make changes if required? Are you prepared to increase your production capacity if required? Do you have dedicated experience export personnel? or do you have 100% top management commitment to export? These are some of the questions you have to find the answers for. Also, what strengths you can build on? Review what you're good at. Is your strength in research and development or have you developed advanced technology? Is it the customer service? In terms of do you stay in touch with your clients and provide after service or additional service? Or perhaps something else, is it your marketing expertise? Or is it your strength in the production process? Are you able to produce a product with reduced cost, standardized and to fit the requirements of the market and to sell in large volumes? And finally, not lastly, do you have a unique product and have you created already a niche place in Australia? The most important question here to answer also is, are your strengths transferable to service the overseas markets? You have to clearly identify your strengths to support export. However, the weaknesses have to be addressed as well. However, you may find it difficult in making your own assessments and perhaps you might consider involving the services of independent consultant to discover the areas requiring your attention. You may discover that your company weaknesses may be lack of experience, lack of marketing ability, slow production, need more staff or need to improve technology no funds allocated for export or not sufficient funds allocated to export, inability to change the product or packaging. So be realistic with your export goal, be flexible and adaptable. The second step of the process is, is organizing for exports and identifying opportunities. We will cover obtaining preliminary desk research, market selection and evaluation and market exploratory visits. Preliminary desk research from reliable sources has to be undertaken. Some of the areas to cover are current exports and potential target markets, also the current political, economic, social, competitive environments, the relevant laws and regulations in, in the market, labeling and packaging requirements, import licenses and quotas, and the rules of origin requirements, um, the certificates of origin requirements, export logistics and tariff and non-tariff barriers of trade. There are some of the areas you should pay attention to. Tariff, bar tariff barriers to trade are the tariffs on imports uh, the overseas markets impose. Non-tariff barriers uh, refer to import licenses, quotas, seasonal import re regimes, state subsidies and complex regulatory environments. For example, um, in other markets you have different legal uh, practices, li uh, different banking uh, practices. Product registrations could be also an issue in certain markets. Some practical advice for you in relation to your preliminary market research is uh, make a need to know list. Use reliable information sources such as Austria, the Chamber of Commerce and other government, non-government entities. And I will provide you with the list uh, you can consider referring to in the end of my presentation. Also use trade publications, university libraries, you can use internet, but just be careful because on internet there is a lot of information. Just try to use reliable sources from internet. Select data carefully and verify the data by cross-referencing or other activities and look for major trends. Research is very important to help you with your export market screening, selection and evaluation. As a guide, you can uh, use the criterion displayed in the screen. Market characteristics, competitive conditions, financial and economic conditions, legislative and 
socio-political conditions, modify these criteria to reflect what is specific to your product or service. Get a statistics under each criterion heading. You can look back at previous years to identify trends, match the information to your strengths, and then rank the markets. You can use our market attractiveness matrix as a guidance. If you need assistance, you can contact us and we can help you with the process. One example for you today on how you can evaluate and select markets of interest based on the marketing matrix. Keep in mind, marketing is only one of the many other factors when evaluating and selecting potential markets. Some practical advice. When evaluating markets, you can start with a list, let's say five or six, then reduce the number to one or two, which are the most promising ones. If you're a first-time exporter, you might consider looking at markets that have similar characteristics to Australia, particular in the areas of legal business practices, consumer tastes, patterns and behaviors. Once you have the experience, you might consider exporting to other markets. The next step is visiting the market you have selected. You have to do your homework first in terms of planning the trip and the content and planning of your meetings. Which companies I'm having meetings with, who is the right person to send overseas, what arrangement and additional research is required, when my meetings will take place with my targeted contacts. While you're conducting your meetings, also research the available distribution channels for your product. In this initial stage of primary research, the aim is to maximize sales with the shortest possible distribution chain, minimizing the impact on the final user price. When visiting the market, the different language, especially the sign of language in meetings, the different religion, social lifestyle and other factors can result in a lack of cross-cultural communication or you misinterpreting uh, the message. We strongly recommend to have expert assistance in the market, especially if you're a first-time exporter. Marketing collateral, it has to be in both languages, including your business cards. And do not try to sell on the first visit. Your first visit is for the purpose of making the contacts, uh, making the um, relationships and also learning about the market. And keep your records. You may be able to claim on any EMDG grants your marketing expenses. The next step is determining the appropriate market entry strategy. Some factors to consider are the level of control over your goods or services. Do you prefer to keep ownership of your goods, which is the case when engaging an agent? Or do you feel that you can completely trust your selected distributor with your goods as they'll be taking the possession of the goods if you decide to go ahead with using a distributor? The physical distribution capabilities of potential distributors are also a factor. Be careful if your distributor is promising you the world, especially if they try to gain exclusivity from you. Again, market research is vital when evaluating and selecting distributors. What is their reputation at the marketplace? What market coverage they offer? Do they carry competitive brands as this could be a problem as they may display more interest on selling the other brand versus your brand? After sales service requirements um, also is a factor in determining the market entry strategy, which would be the best option for you to deliver the additional services. Funds available, this is also a critical factor. The level of barriers that have been identified in the market. You may require experienced person with contacts and extensive networks to be in the market to overcome these barriers so your business to succeed. Possible market entry strategies. Agent is one of them. Agent uh, usually works on a fixed commission, will not take the possession of title to goods or distribute the goods. The purpose of the agent is to be handling orders and the sales paperwork and to be a company contact for a network of importers and distributors. The distributor is another option. This is the preferred option for many exporters that um, desire a representative to accept uh, sole marketing responsibility, including taking possession of the goods. Please note that finding the right distributor is critical to your business. It is important to get it right from the beginning and can, we can help you with the process. Other options are the joint venture. In order to develop greater control over sales and distribution and to handle local manufacturing, assembly and packaging, some manufacturers set up foreign subsidiaries or uh, joint venture operations with local partner. And for some countries, a joint venture um, market entry strategy could be the only available option. Licensing is another market entry strategy option. It's a grant of permission, usually for a payment of royalty um, 
or a fee by the license or to the licensee to exploit some form of IP, right? Could be patent, could be trademarks, copyright or design. Franchising is a sophisticated form of licensing when the franchisor usually remains a considerable control over the market development. Our next step is the marketing and planning side of your export operations. This is a mega one. Unfortunately, uh, we're very time restricted today and I'm going to give you just the main points to start your thinking in this direction. Developing, monitoring and updating your export market plan is important for your export operations. The export plan is a separate plan from the business plan for your domestic operations. Just treat it as extension to your business plan. You can see on the screen the components of the export plan and the main points that you have to consider uh, when you're putting together your export plan. And these are some of the common mistakes you should avoid. To succeed in the global marketplace, you need a sound export strategy. A sound export strategy will assist you with your dealings with bankers, with government agencies, distributors, clients, and anybody else who will be involved in your business dealings overseas. The sound export strategy also ensures your domestic and international marketing activities are aligned and also assists you to understand uh, your organizational strengths and if there are any weaknesses, you will be able to identify your weaknesses and actually work on them. Allows also your team to better understand the company growth objectives and um, able to manage and understand changes within the organizations. What you have to know also is very important that you have to develop your export strategy, but you also have to monitor your export strategy. And um, if changes are required, you have to be flexible to make these changes. If you need assistance with your export plan, export strategy, action plan, promotional plans, product strategy, pricing strategy, and all other components of the total planning uh, process, we're here to help. The next step is to address the regulatory and legal aspects such as the legal agreements. Please seek professional legal advice and Hopkut Ghanem are here to help. Some of the agreements you will come across are the contract of sale, distribution agreement, agency agreement, franchising agreement, and many other aspects of um, legal agreements or requirements. Also IP protection, patents and trademarks registrations are required in the market and you need a professional for this. Export licenses, import quotas, import licenses, custom controls. These are some of the other regulatory requirements you have to consider. In relation to banking, find a bank which is knowledgeable in international trade with your market of interest. Uh, they will be helping you with your letter of credits and they'll be helping you to be able to obtain your payments from overseas. Henry Curran can help you also with um, the banks and with budgeting and with other, any other matters when it comes to your financial accounting and um, your overseas expansion. Financing, speak to your bank and to EFIC as well. Insurance, speak to EFIC and also consider obtaining marine insurance. Good financial risk management, adequate to insurance and payment procedures in place should be put in place. An Export Finance and Insurance Corporation ethic can help you with this. You may also consider marine insurers to cover possible damages. Because things may not always go to plan. The next step is exporting logistics and export documentation. To develop some understanding of the process and the cost is vital uh, for your export operations. Also, please discuss the process and your export documentation requirements with experienced freight forwarder, especially if you're a first-time exporter. And discuss with the Chamber of Commerce, that is us, the Certificates of Origin requirements. Many of you are probably not aware that the Chambers of Commerce have been issuing non-preferential Certificates of Origin since 1923. We have been authorized under various international conventions to do so. More recently, uh, working closely with customs authorities and accommodating the requirements of the various free trade agreements Australia has with other countries, the Chambers of Commerce are issuing preferential certificates of origin, or as we call them, the FTA certificates of origin. As a matter of fact, the World Chamber Federation, which is uniting the global network of 12,000 chambers, 
is the author of the International Certificates of Origin Guidelines publication, which establishes the standard procedures for issuing and assess attesting certificates of origin by all chambers across the globe. The World Chamber Federation also manages the ATA carnet system, which allows for the duty-free and tax-free temporary imports of goods to the World Chamber network. In Australia, through the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we are authorised by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to issue preferential and non-preferential certificates of origin. ACI, which is the overarching body of the individual state chambers of commerce, ensures that the authorised chambers follow strict documentary evidence issuing procedures and remain just ends compliant to be able to issue preferential certificates of origin. The key message here is that we not only issue certificates of origin and ATA carnets, but we also have the systems in place and the global support to monitor and resolve issues at overseas destinations. And if there are any irregularities or issues with your certificate of origin, we can intervene through Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and resolve the matter at the customs port. Many customs measures relating to goods being imported into a country, in particular those relating to tariff and public help, depends for the administration on the origin of the goods. And the increasing number and complexity of preferential free trade agreements has emphasized the importance of currently identifying the origin of imports. Claims for preferential treatment must usually be accompanied by official certificates stating the origin of the goods. This could be certificate of Australian origin or in other cases it could be certified declaration of origin. The certificate of Australian origin is the documentary evidence that the goods originate from Australia. In the case with uh, preferential certificates resulting from the various free trade agreements Australia has with other countries, such as um, ANS, the free trade agreement, Thailand, Australia, free trade agreements, Australia, Chile, free trade agreement, Korea, Australia, free trade agreement, JEPA, uh, which is the Japan, Australia, economic partnership agreement, and China. Australia Free Trade Agreement, these preferential certificates of origin are evidence that the goods are originating from the territory of one or more parties of the particular FTA. What you have to actually uh, know is that without the certificate of origin, you wouldn't be able to claim the, the reduced tariffs under the Free Trade Agreement because this is part of the requirement. So when you're exporting um, goods overseas to any of these markets, please contact us so you can actually organize uh, the appropriate certificate of origin to be able to claim the tariffs at destination. This, this will be your import um, uh, responsibility, by the way. And also, you can um, use the competitive advantage of reduced tariff rates when you're negotiating e uh, export sales contracts with overseas importers as well, because it will be cheaper for them to import items from Australia because your rates will be actually better than if they use somebody from another uh, country and they have, uh, they have to pay higher duty rates at destination. So please contact us uh, when, when you come to this point of your exporting. We can issue both electronic certificates and manual certificates and it's the same day service. Some advice for you on what not to do. To achieve the positive outcomes, obtain export advice um, at the very beginning of your export planning is critical. So is looking at the capacity of your business and personnel. Does your existing business capacity can accommodate additional export orders? What about if a larger than expected or export order came your way? Do you have the capacity to expand your business resources, including additional production facilities if required, within a reasonable time frame? What about the personnel? Did you select additional and experience and dedicate to your future export operation staff or are you relying on the existing staff to manage the domestic business and your international expansion at the same time? You don't have to give us the answer, but if this is the second, think twice as your domestic business can suffer, so as the future plans for your export expansion. Please also don't assume that all markets are the same and you can replicate your domestic business model in other markets. It is not the case. And finally, and not lastly, you need commitment to exporting from top management, and this is a big one. This is also empiric empirically supported years ago by the conclusions in a study I did for Griffith University uh, a few years ago on the effects of barrier to export on export marketing performance, where I have investigated the relationship between the barriers to export and export marketing performance. 
The conclusion of this 19-page study was that the management characteristics of the firm was the only barrier to export that had a significant effect on the export marketing performance of Queensland-based exporters. And for your information, furthermore, um, you might find this beneficial, is that the findings indicated that managerial indifference towards the value ex exporting, management emphasis on developing domestic markets, a lack of capacity dedicated towards the continuing supply of export, and insufficient personnel to manage international trade activities have a significant effect on a firm export marketing performance. So if you're intending to succeed in your future export operations, Top management, please avoid a negative attitude towards exporting. Consider taking international expansion operations rather than focusing on domestic markets alone. Consider involving in exporting on a regular basis rather than using exporting only when the domestic market is weak. And finally, export training programs must be developed and implemented for all personnel involved in exporting. And these are the three critical success factors. Commitment to export markets, developed close long-term relationships, and developed and successfully executed plan. Now, very briefly, I'm going to introduce to you our Chamber Initiative Export Growth China program, which is the perfect opportunity for business matching and exporting new products to China. I realize that this information session is targeting exporters new to exporting. However, it is good to know that this program is also available to you once you are export ready. Expo Growth China is a government-supported, low-risk, low-cost program specifically for Australian small and medium enterprises, developed and highly subsidized by the Chambers. The program has opened on the 1st of July 2015 and officially was launched in August 2015. The program assists exporters to promote their products and business matching with Chinese buyers through various activities run by the Australian Business Chamber Shanghai Office and Showroom. The program is open to all Chambers of Commerce members across Australia. Some of the uh, items covered by the program are online China export readiness report, online promotion, showroom display, showroom promotion, public relations, Mandarin translation, market testing program reports, China training, and many other. In relation to personnel, we have a dedicated team of business development, trade and marketing professionals based in China, an additional team based in Sydney. You can see on the screen the showroom display uh, of some of the products. Australian iconic brands such as Acubra and Byron Bay Cookies and many others have joined the program. This is program works. Only two months after the Export Growth China program officially started, the China team screened over 3,000 Chinese businesses generated 107 quality leads to program participants and secured over $42 million of sales for our participants. If this program is of interest to you, please let me know um, after the event and I will ask the manager of China team to follow up with you with the particulars. But don't forget you must become a chamber member first to be able to take advantage of this program. And the final step to exporting is to ask for assistance from reliable sources. These organizations can help you with your market research, business matching, strategy development, and all other aspects of your future export operations. I have provided you with some um, website links to assist you with your uh, market research. And these are my contact details and the end of my presentation for today. If you have any questions, just please follow up with me. My name is Lea Fu. I'm a senior associate in the corporate advisor group at Hopgood Ganim Lawyers. Hopgood Ganim Lawyers is a full service law firm with offices in Brisbane and Perth, and we also have a representative office in Shanghai in China. At Hopgood Ganim, we see trade and export as a key area of growth and are delighted to be able to participate in this event. Can I thank Henrik Curran for this great initiative? My intention is to provide a brief overview of two key matters uh, for uh, exporters. One is topical for Australian exporters, and the other is constant if you are an exporter or thinking of getting into exports. I will provide a brief status update on the three recent bilateral free trade agreements which Australia has entered into. These are the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement and the Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement. 
In addition, I will also give you an update on the status of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is yet to come into force. In the limited time available, I cannot go into too much detail. However, I propose to give a quick overview of the key outcomes under these free trade agreements and the current status and the potential benefit to Australian exporters. In the second part of my presentation, I will focus on the key legal issues that exporters will need to take into consideration when planning their export strategies. Previously mentioned, these are the most recent free trade agreements which Australia has entered into. In addition, Australia and 11 other countries are currently negotiating their entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, or CHAFTA as it is commonly known, was signed in Canberra, Canberra on 17 June 2015 and entered into force on 20 December 2015. CHAFTA was hailed as a great success, granting Australian businesses unprecedented access to China's markets. It is expected that more than 85% of Australian goods exported to China will be duty-free upon CHAFTA coming into force and this figure is expected to reach 93% in four years' time. At full implementation, 95% of goods exported to China under CHAFTA will be tariff-free. The commodities that will benefit from tariff reduction and elimination under CHAFTA will include, for agribusiness, beef, dairy, sheep and goat meat, pork, fruit, vegetables and nuts, barley, sorghum and other grains, and also wine and spirits and seafood. For the resources industry, the uh, tariffs on coking coal will be eliminated, as will thermal coal, and for manufactured goods, favourable treatment will be given to pharmaceutical products, car parts and engines, amongst other things. If you are an exporter of services to China, the services that will benefit include legal services, education services, financial services and health and aged care services. Chapter includes a most favoured nation clause so that Australia's competitive advantage is protected if in the future China extends more beneficial treatment to other trading partners. The Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement or CAFTA was entered into force on 12 December 2014. The major beneficiaries of CAFTA include beef, dairy, sugar, cherries, oranges, wheat, wine and manufactured goods. Under CAFTA, Korea will progressively eliminate tariffs on Australian manufactured resources and energy products by January 1, 2023. Service providers will have greater access to the Korean market. This will include particularly the legal, accounting, telecommunications, education and financial sectors. The Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement entered into force on 15 January 2015. Direct benefits of this uh, free trade agreement include on full implementation, 97% of Australian exports to Japan will be duty free. Almost all resources, energy and manufacturing imports will be duty free. And also a number of agricultural in industries such as beef, fruit and vegetables will receive gradual tariff reductions with some being duty free by 2014. Since entry into force on 15 January 2014, more than 99.7% of Japan's imports of resources, energy and manufacturing products from Australia by value in 2013 entered Japan duty-free, with most remaining tariffs to be eliminated within 10 years. On full Im implementation of the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement, all of Australia's current resources, energy and manufactured exports worth more than 40 billion in 2014 to 2015 will benefit from tariff-free entry into Japan. The Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement or TPP has been signed by Australia but has not yet come into force. Critically, uh, countries such as the United States are yet to sign the TPP. A few quick facts on the TPP. It is a regional free trade agreement that will include when it comes into full force and effect, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, the United States and Vietnam, and will constitute around 40% of global GDP in terms of countries. 
It has been signed by Australia's former Trade and Investment Minister on 4th of February 2016 and is currently before the Australian Parliament's Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. The anticipated benefits of the TPP are easier access to overseas markets by small to medium businesses and increase in trade opportunities across the board. It will be easier to compete with big corporations and government enterprises and the intention is to eliminate tariffs for 98% of the region. As you can appreciate, what I have given you is, a, is very basic information on these free trade agreements. If you have ever had an opportunity to look at these documents, they are quite long. However, if you require detailed information, uh, we would be happy to provide this information separately. As you can appreciate, there are a number of commodities that are treated favourably across all these free trade agreements, and uh, these include the resources sector, and in particular for agribusiness, beef comes out as a big winner in all these free trade agreements. Free trade agreements are at their heart about eliminating barriers to trade, and this includes the reduction and elimination of tariffs on goods and services coming into a country. For Australian exporters to countries with whom we have a free trade agreement, it offers a competitive advantage that may not be available to competitors from other countries. If you are an Australian exporter and you wish to take advantage of the reduced tariff rate for a particular product with a country with whom we have a free trade agreement, the mere act of exporting will not give you access to these benefits. You will need to take positive steps to put in place the relevant documentation, including a certificate of origin, and provide this to your importer. I would highly recommend that you undertake appropriate due diligence and take proper advice prior to undertaking any form of exporting. In addressing the key legal issues when exporting, this is aimed at those businesses that are looking to add exporting to their business model. These are issues that should be addressed prior to embarking on exporting your products or services. There are myriad legal issues to consider. However, the basic issues which I would like to address are your legal documentation, getting your payment mechanism right, protecting your intellectual property and resolving disputes. When considering the documentation uh, that is appropriate for your export business, it is critical to determine a number of things. This includes determining the appropriate form of legal agreement, and to an extent, this depends on the legal relationship you will have with your importer, whether this is a distribution arrangement, an agency arrangement, or a direct sale to the importer will determine to a large extent what the form of the agreement will take. In each agreement, the roles of the parties will need to be clearly defined to avoid disputes down the track. This will include the duties of each party, any time frames that attach to those duties, and the obligations of each party in respect of that particular transaction. You will also need to clearly define what products or services you are exporting. It would be of great value to each exporter to invest in a template form of agreement. This will avoid unnecessary costs where you will have a form of template agreement available for each uh, export arrangement that you have, whether this is a direct sale, appointment of an agent, or engagement of an importer to undertake a distribution arrangement. Finally, you should also ensure that you pick an appropriate jurisdiction. Uh, in each case, we often recommend uh, Australian exporters uh, pick Australia and Australian jurisdiction as the appropriate jurisdiction. However, uh, this will to a large extent depend on your negotiations with your importer. Uh, you need to be aware of the cross-border risks involved in cross-border transactions, uh, in particular if you need to undertake some kind of recovery action against an importer or your counterparty. When considering the most appropriate payment mechanism in your export transaction, there is no right or wrong uh, answer. It depends very much on your negotiations with your counterparty. However, 
I would like to draw your attention to the four basic elements of payment mechanisms that often arise in export transactions. They are cash in advance, payment by open account, payment by collection, and letters of credit. There are varying levels of risk uh, attached to each of those forms of payment. For an exporter, the ideal situation is where you are paid upfront. However, this isn't always possible and you may need to look at various forms of payment mechanisms which can include any of these four options. As you can see, uh, ensuring that you have an appropriate payment mechanism in your contract is critical. To a large extent, this will also uh, drive the need for due diligence on the buyer or your importer. In this respect, you should undertake and obtain appropriate advice in relation to the contractual arrangements that you have in place. In this diagram, the risk profile for the exporter and the importer is illustrated in respect of each payment mechanism that is available. Where you are the exporter, the most secure form of payment is where you are. You receive payment up front. The least secure is where you have an open account where the importer pays you on receipt of the particular product that you are exporting. When considering the most appropriate payment mechanism for the particular transaction you are looking at, you should have regard to the risk profile for each of those payment mechanisms. I would now like to turn to uh, considerations in relation to uh, intellectual property. In any transaction, intellectual property uh, considerations are key and more so for uh, an ex export transaction where you are dealing in a cross-border setting. The types of intellectual property rights that you will need to take into consideration will include copyright, such as copyright over your manuals, plans and any software codes, patent rights over your inventions, methods and discoveries, also any trademark rights and plant breeders rights. There's also potentially proprietary rights uh, in confidential information, data, trade secrets and know-how and it would be highly advisable to obtain proper advice in relation to the protection of these rights. In relation to ownership of intellectual property, when you trade with new companies or engage an agent to export your goods internationally, retaining ownership of any intellectual property subject of the export is crucial. Make sure that you have solid agreements in place that are clear on who owns background intellectual property, that is intellectual property that was created before the relationship, new intellectual property, that is intellectual property that will be created by either party in the future as a result of the relationship. Also beware of blanket clauses in export agreements that cause you to assign all intellectual property to your counterparty. License your intellectual property only where there is a practical need on the counterparty's part to use it and be clear that what exactly the counterparty can and cannot do with it. You should also consider registration of your intellectual property rights. For some types of intellectual property, for example trademarks, certain rights are only vested in the intellectual property owner once they have been registered. Most registrations are jurisdiction specific, so if you begin trade in a new country, you should consider registering your intellectual property rights in that country. You should beware of first to file jurisdictions. For example, the Australian position is different to the Chinese position. In relation to security regarding your intellectual property rights, ask your counterparties Ask about your counterparty's security practices. Are there any laws in your counterparty's country regarding security requirements? Data encryption and access restrictions for staff are a good way to minimise misuse or accidental disclosure of your intellectual property. Consider the effects of parting ways. 
In export agreements, you will need to address what happens to confidential information that has been exchanged thus far when an agreement is terminated, what happens to any intellectual property licences when the agreement is terminated or expires, and finally, what provisions are in place to hold the other party accountable for misuse of your intellectual property if the termination is not amicable or the other side is negligent. Unfortunately, it is a fact of life that in certain cross-border transactions, disputes can be inevitable. Often disputes arise where there is uncertainty. And therefore, it is incumbent on counterparties to ensure that any agreement they enter into minimises any uncertainty that may lead to any disputes. Where it is necessary to undertake any form of dispute resolution process, you should be aware that this can be costly and time consuming. If you are able to undertake that particular form of dispute resolution in Australia, that may save you time. However, if you are forced to undertake some form of dispute resolution in a foreign jurisdiction, the cost to you can be quite significant. It should be something that each exporter should plan for. Where the dispute may arise as a result of any payment mechanism, this will become even more critical when drafting your payment mechanism in your contractual arrangements. I would now like to address some of the key regulatory requirements that any exporter will need to be aware of. If you are undertaking any export transaction, you should ensure that you have the appropriate export licenses. You should ensure that you are dealing with an importer with the required import license or approvals. For example, in the recently approved live cattle export protocol between Australia and China, there is a requirement that the Australian exporter have the requisite Australian export licenses, but in, in addition to that, uh, there is also a, requ a requirement for approval from the relevant Chinese government department. This may take time and it may also require uh, some capital outlay by the exporter as well. This underscores the need for the exporter and the importer to discuss at an early stage how they can negotiate and cooperate with each other in relation to obtaining and maintaining any regulatory approvals or requirements. Accordingly, it is essential to undertake proper market research in your target jurisdiction in order to ensure that you have the appropriate documentation to obtain any benefit under a free trade agreement, you must also obtain the appropriate advice. The final issues I would like to address uh, are some of the key trading issues that come up in export transactions. They include the use of INCO terms. These are trading terms that are regularly used in cross-border transactions. They are fairly technical terms and you should obtain the appropriate advice on the usage of those terms as they have implications for the trading relationship and your costs. You should also ensure that you have obtained and maintain any appropriate insurance and these will need to be considered in the light of any INCO terms that you use. Your direct sale contract or agency agreement or distribution agreement will not be the only legally binding contract that you will enter into. You should be aware of and plan for other legal contracts that you may have to enter into, such as any shipping contracts to transport your goods or any service contracts that you might have to enter into as part of exporting your particular service to your, any foreign jurisdiction. EFIC provides financial support to Australian exporters, companies in export supply chains and companies establishing overseas facilities. 
We offer Australian companies loans, guarantees and bonds to help them compete and grow internationally. It was clear for us when we looked at the size of the US market that it was a really big opportunity. You know, we, we have an addressable market of about 6,000 businesses in Australia compared to the 90,000 businesses in the US. So we decided, well, if we could take our model and replicate it over in the US, then we should be 10 times more successful. I started Studio Agency in 2008. I was 19 years old at the time and I really didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I knew that I was passionate about working and doing something amazing in the fashion industry. We provide a range of services to the drug discovery sector. It's very much an export focused business because that's where most of the market is. At EFIC, we're specialists. We understand the export and export supply chain business. And we work closely with banks to help Australian businesses succeed. EFIC was, uh, was able to provide us with a total bond facility of 500,000 Australian dollars. Without that bond, uh, we may have had to turn the contract down. Our future is pretty exciting. On the back of these two projects, it's something that's different out there. So we hope that'll actually springboard our business globally, and that's in the, the rail space. I believe that Epicam can achieve revenues of $10 million uh, within the next five or six years. Without the Epic loan, I doubt whether we would have had this lab, and without the lab, we probably wouldn't have a business. In the last 12 months, we uh, have grown from 11 to more than 60 staff, and our revenue has grown by 250%. So without the ODI guarantee, we might have failed at the first step. So the future for Studio Agency, I feel, is very much um, taking on the world. We started small, but I think in the next couple of years, we're um, yeah, heading overseas in a really big way. So it's very exciting things to come. With your support, we look forward to helping even more Australian SMEs in 2016 take their products and services to the world. Thank you for your attention. We hope you find benefit from this selection of specialist resources that have been tailored for businesses new to exporting. To access a link to these resources, please go to www.hanrickcurran.com.au forward slash events and follow the links under recently held events.